Chair of Physics Department of Sharif University of Technology. And I would like to welcome uh, everybody to this uh, great uh, seminar. Let's welcome to uh, Sharif University and PSI uh, Public Talks on Frontiers of Physics. It's my great pleasure to open the first session of Public Talk on Frontiers of Physics, which is a joint web, uh, webinar of Sharif University of Technology and Physics Society of Iran. It's planned to have a bi-monthly public talk by one of the uh, uh, leading experts in physics. And uh, I will say that uh, the Physics Department of Sheriff University of Technology is very proud to host virtually frontiers in physics uh, in this series of webinars, which is a collaboration by my colleagues, Professor Arfai, Professor Faraji, and Professor Trabian, and uh, also some people from Physics Society of Iran. With thanks to all of uh, their efforts, let us start the first session. The chair of this session is Professor Wafa from Harvard University, who will introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Edward Witt. Please start. Thank you. خیلی ممنون. سلام به دوستان علم در ایران. باعث خوشحالی منه که امروز ادوارد ویتن برای دانش دوستان ایران سخنرانی خواهد کرد. حدود 40 سال پیش بود که ایشون استاد راهنمای من در دوران دکتران بود. برنامه امروز با پیگیری دکتر عرفایی و کوشش جمعی دیگر از دوستان از جمله دکتر ترابیان و دکتر فرجی صورت میگیره و اجازه بدید بقیه برنامه رو به انگلیسی برگزار کنیم. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the first speaker in this series, Edward Witten. Edward Witten is well known to science lovers all around the world, including here in Iran, and so he really needs no introduction. And nevertheless, just for the sake of completeness, let me just say a few words about him and his work. Edward is one of the most prominent and perhaps the most prominent living theoretical physicist. His work has not only significantly impacted essentially all areas of theoretical physics, but has also significantly changed a large portion of ma pure mathematics. Many of his works on physics involve developing uh, diverse aspects of string theory, a theory which is believed to be the fundamental theory of nature, unifying quantum theory with all known forces. He has single-handedly revolutionized the application of theoretical physics to mathematics by developing the notion of topological field theory, which continues to play a key role in many developments in modern mathematics today. He is the only physicist to have been recognized with the highest honor in mathematics, which is the Fields Medal. Among one of his mathematical works is a conjecture he made about surfaces, which known as Witten Conjecture, which was later proven by mathematicians. In fact, one of the most important works of the late Mariam Mirzakhani, which was a key to her receiving the Fields Medal, was to provide the proof of Witten's conjecture. I do not wish to take more of your time to tell you about his other works and recognitions, in fact, going over all his recognitions would take longer than his talk today. Instead, let me just say that there are almost no significant recognitions in the field of physics or mathematical physics that one can think of that he has not already received. Without taking more of your time, let me end my introduction and let us all listen to Edward Witten's talk on observations of black holes. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Kumran, and thanks for this invitation to speak to the audience in Iran, which I greatly appreciate. Although I'd like to say that I hope to visit uh, in person at some point, hopefully in the not too distant future when things change. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about, um, <clears throat> uh, well, the topic is light rays and black holes, but really I'm going to be talking about black holes in general relativity. So general relativity is Einstein's theory of, of gravity. It's his greatest achievement. It was completed in November 1915. This was during the First World War. Einstein was living in Berlin. He never supported the war and he was horrified at the attitude of many of his colleagues who forgot all their prior beliefs and uh, on both sides of the conflict supported it. But uh, 
as he was completely disengaged from what was going on and totally opposed to it, really. He had plenty of time to work on his theories. And as I said, he completed his theory of gravity in November 1915 in the midst of the war, which had started a little over a year earlier. Almost immediately, the distinguished mathematician and astronomer Carl Schwarzschild, who's pictured here, discovered what we now know as the first black hole solution of Einstein's theory. Uh, Carl Schwarzschild was one of the relatively few people in the world at the time who had the mathematical expertise to understand what Einstein was saying. And he, as I say, almost immediately after the theory was invented, he discovered the first solution of Einstein's equations that describes a black hole. <clears throat> uh, Schwarzschild was 41 years old when the war broke out. And in contrast to Einstein, he did support the war. He thought it was his duty to volunteer for service. His discovery of the black hole solution was done on the Eastern Front, where he soon fell ill and died in May 1916. Now, Schwarzschild was not thinking about anything crazy like a black hole. And after, even after he found the solution, neither he nor anyone else for a long time understood what it really represented. He was just trying to understand in Einstein's theory, the gravitational field of an ordinary body like the sun. So actually Einstein in his original work had done an approximate calculation of the gravitational field of the sun and had used it to calculate a very tiny correction to the orbit of the planet Mercury, which actually had been measured in the 19th century, but had never been explained previously. So Einstein's initial triumph depended on approximately understanding the gravitational field of the sun but Einstein's solution was only good at big distances where the field was weak. Schwarzschild found an exact solution of Einstein's equations, which was good even near the surface of the sun. And if you let the sun collapse to a smaller body, Schwarzschild's solution was good all the way in. And if you really go all the way in, it ends up that Schwarzschild's solution describes a black hole, but no one understood that for a long time. Now, as I said, Schwarzschild's solution was, under, was discovered almost immediately after the theory was invented in 1915. It wasn't until 47 years later that the next important, astrophysically important black hole solution was discovered by Roy Kerr of New Zealand. This is a comparatively recent picture. It doesn't show him as he was in 1962 when he discovered the solution as a young man. So even after these solutions were known, it took a long time for anyone to take seriously what they said. And then when evidence began to pile up that black holes really do exist in the heavens, the evidence was very indirect. So for example, astronomers would see objects so heavy and small that it seemed they must be black holes. And some of these objects emitted huge amounts of energy, which could be explained by the gravitational field of a black hole. But it seemed for many, for, for decades really, as the evidence for black holes piled up, it was extremely indirect and really direct proof of black holes seemed to be well out of reach. <clears throat> but that's changed in the last few years, mainly for two reasons. One was the observation starting in 2015 by an observatory in the United States, the LIGO Observatory, of gravitational waves from colliding black holes. And the second was the first close-up photograph of the neighborhood of a black hole, which was released just in 2019 by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. So both of these really made international news when they were discovered. So it's quite likely that most of you, even if you're not physicists, and as this is a public talk, probably most of you are not, but still you would very likely have heard or read at least something about both of these developments. However, I'm going to be explaining them in somewhat more detail. So I'm going to start by showing a movie and then we'll discuss what we've seen. The movie is a computer simulation that shows what the initial LIGO event would have looked like from a distance of a few thousand kilometers. So this movie and all my movies are made by the so-called extreme space-time team. So, uh, so as I say, we'll look at the movie, then we'll talk about it, and then we'll watch the movie a second time. So the black discs that you can see are the uh, two black holes orbiting each other. And uh, 
um, the, the dots are stars that are farther behind. And as the black holes move around, you see that the star images are moving. And now you're about to see the black holes merging. Uh, by the way, can you see my cursor now? Uh, I think. No. I think I remember I have to set that up. Okay. Now you can see my cursor, I think. Correct. Okay. So one thing you'll notice is that in the movie, the black holes do look like black holes in space. So even without seeing it as a movie, just in this still shot that you're seeing at the moment, I think you see black holes where you don't see any star images. Now we're looking at stars <clears throat> that are more distant than the black hole. In the movie, we are a few thousand kilometers from the black hole and the star, the two black holes, the stars are much more distant. And the black holes look like black holes in space because they block light coming from behind. Here's your eye schematically. Here's a star, although in the movie, the stars are much more distant than I'm drawing. And a ray that would come to us straight from the star is blocked by the black hole, which is why it looks like a black hole in space. That doesn't mean we can't see a star that's behind the black hole. We see it because of the way light is bent by the gravitational field of the black hole. So here I've depicted a ray that's bent around the black hole and reaches the eye over here. Now, you'll see the star, but you won't perceive it as being where it, quote, really is, unquote. <clears throat> when the ray comes to you on this curve, you'll perceive the black hole as being, the, the star as being somewhere up here. So its apparent image will be up here. If you've studied relativity theory, you know that it's a little tricky to say what's really true. But anyway, the observer's perception will be that the star is up here, not down here. Now, I've explained it as if we just see one image of any star, but actually we'll see multiple images of the same star. That's most obvious if the star is symmetrically placed. Then there's a ray that goes above the black hole to the eye and a ray that goes below the black hole to the eye. It's less obvious in this picture, but a ray that goes even closer to the black hole will go in a complicated orbit all the way around and will eventually reach the eye again. So although I've only drawn the two simplest ones, there actually are many orbits from the star that will reach the eye. Now, if the star, if the star is really perfectly placed behind a spherically symmetric black hole, then with a little imagination, you might be able to see that you'll see a ring known as an Einstein ring. So you see, there's a ray that goes above the black hole. There's a ray that, hmm. You're not seeing the cursor anymore. I don't know what I did to lose that. Okay, there's a ray that goes above the black hole. There's a ray that goes below the black hole, but in a symmetrical situation, there'd be a ray that comes above the picture and also a ray that goes into the picture behind the black hole. And in a perfectly symmetrical situation, the ray could go around the black hole in any direction and still reach the eye. And so you'd see a perfect ring centered on the position of the black hole. So with a little imagination, you might see that if a star is perfectly symmetrically placed behind the black hole, you'll see a ring known as an Einstein ring. So Einstein described this in a paper in 1935, but he thought he was just imagining, uh, well, he, he thought it was a theoretical game that would never be tested because he didn't know that black holes really existed. For the objects he knew that existed in the, in the sky, the Einstein ring would be so tiny that he thought it was unrealistic to observe it. But nowadays we do have pictures of Einstein rings, as I'll show you in a second. I'll discuss later what we have in pictures of an Einstein ring due to a black hole, but actually what may be our best Einstein ring is an Einstein ring caused by a galaxy bending the light rather than a black hole. So this is a very unusual picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. In the center, this yellowish roundish object is a galaxy that's quite distant, 
but not nearly as distant as a blue galaxy behind it. This blue galaxy behind it, it's blue because it's brighter, uh, sorry, hotter. The blue galaxy behind it has been, well, intrinsically it would look like one of these objects, more or less point-like, but it's been, its image has been bent into a nearly perfect Einstein ring by the yellowish white galaxy that's closer to us. So this is a picture that shows a nearly perfect Einstein ring, actually. A little bit is missing on the top. Now that was a very atypical picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. Nobody had lined up these two galaxies one behind the other to make a perfect or almost perfect Einstein ring. It was just a lucky coincidence. This is a more typical Hubble deep field photo. So in the foreground, the relatively large galaxies are a cluster of galaxies in the foreground. If you look closely in the picture, you'll see many arcs. Here's an orangish red arc. Here's a small arc. Here's another arc. The arcs are pieces of Einstein rings where we're seeing um, a much more distant galaxy, the light from which has been bent into a partial Einstein ring. It's a partial Einstein ring because the, well, a variety of things, the distant galaxy is not perfectly centered, but also the foreground galaxy isn't perfectly symmetric. And there's in fact more than one foreground galaxy. So no one lined this picture up to make a perfect Einstein ring, but you see many partial Einstein rings. So this is actually what you see in the so-called Hubble deep field. If you take a very long exposure, deep field simply means a very long exposure to see the faintest and most distant objects that you can see. And in a fairly typical Hubble deep field picture like this one, you'll see many partial Einstein rings. Now, we're going to look at the movie one more time, but first let's discuss a few basic things. So first, the two black holes at the beginning are orbiting each other, a little like the Earth orbiting the sun, except that the Earth is much lighter than the sun. So the, uh, so the sun is almost at rest while the Earth orbits around it. Instead here, the two black holes have all comparable masses. So they orbit each other symmetrically. I think in the movie, they have, are taken to have exactly the same masses. Now, as the, I'm sorry, it's hard to focus my hands on the camera. As the black holes orbit each other, they're emitting gravitational radiation, which is what was eventually detected on Earth by the LIGO detector. As they emit gravitational radiation, they lose energy and they fall in closer to each other. Eventually they merge into a single black hole. Finally, since we don't see the black holes directly, what we're seeing in the movie are the stars behind the black hole. And the star field behind them is greatly distorted by the bending of light by the black holes. So let's watch the movie again and see if we understand it a little bit more. So actually one black hole is a little bigger than the other. I think it's meant to be a simulation of the actual LIGO event where that was true. And as they move around, the star images are changing in a way that's rather complicated to describe. Near the end where the black holes are emerging, well, you can see that there's an ellipse around the black holes where the images are particularly unstable. And near the end, that ellipse becomes a circle. You see there's a wobbling on this circle. That circle is the, actually a, an almost perfect Einstein ring due to a star that's almost perfectly placed behind the two black holes. So, well, as we watch it again, you'll see at the end, at the end, see, this is not, ax not axially symmetric. But when the two black holes merge, it becomes actually symmetric. And therefore a star that was perfectly behind the final black holes would make a pure Einstein ring. And the stars that are almost correctly placed are on this circle where the image was unstable at the end. Now, so we've seen that light is deflected by gravity, or at least we saw a movie depicting that effect. And also we saw Hubble Space uh, Space Telescope pictures illustrating it. But why is light deflected by gravity? Well, this was guessed by Einstein even before he had invented his theory. And in fact, others long before Einstein had guessed this. Einstein knew that a comet or planet is deflected by gravity. So he thought it would happen for light. So since Newton's day, 
scientists had known that the deflection of an ordinary body by the sun, for instance, a comet, an asteroid, or a planet, or anything, but let's, um, depends only on its velocity. So an object coming in from a very big distance, like a comet, well, roughly once a year, we see a new comet that comes into the inner solar system that never was there before, as far as we know. As it passes, passes by the sun, it's deflected by an angle that depends only on its velocity. A fast comet is slightly deflected, a slow comet is deflected more. And this formula was well known since Newton's day. So in 1911, before developing his theory, Einstein guessed that the same effect would hold for light. And he simply used the speed of light in Newton's formula to guess how much um, a, um, a light ray would be deflected when it passes by the sun. It's a very small angle. In radians, it's about 10 to the minus six radians. That means in degrees, it's something like a 10,000th ten of a degree, roughly. It's such a small effect that it could only be observed during a total eclipse of the sun. Well, you see, to make the deflection angle as big as possible, you want an object that just barely grazes by the sun, passing by the surface. But the sun, so therefore you want to watch as a star passes so you want to watch as, a, as the sun passes in front of a star so that the light from the star is almost blocked by the sun. But the sun is so bright that you can't see stars that are very close to the sun, except during a total eclipse when the light from the sun is blocked, except for the solar corona. Then it's the solar corona is still rather bright, so it's still difficult to see a star that's very close to the sun, even during a total eclipse, but it's possible. So after Einstein made this prediction, uh, science, astronomers went off to test it. And Einstein was lucky, although at first it looked like bad luck. People tried to test his idea in 1912, but they were rained out. And then they tried to test the idea in Russia in 1914, but that was thwarted by the outbreak of World War I. In fact, the astronomers were almost arrested as spies, but they managed to convince the local police that their instruments were just uh, astronomical telescopes, not spy equipments. So anyway, in 1912 and 1914, attempts to test Einstein's predictions failed. And then Einstein invented his theory that happened in 1915, as I mentioned, during the war. And so the early attempts to test Einstein's prediction failed. And that was kind of lucky because the initial prediction was wrong. In 1915, Einstein finally developed his theory of gravity, and it became clear that the Newtonian formula he had suggested earlier was two times too small. Luckily, it had not been tested. So Einstein's prediction had not been disproved. If the early version of the prediction had been disproved, and then Einstein had come along and fixed it, and saying, oh, this is the real prediction, then when the real prediction was tested, it would have been less convincing. But luckily, there had been no test before the prediction was corrected. Finally, the war ended in 1918, science resumed, and the eclipse prediction, eclipse expedition of 1919 confirmed Einstein's prediction. And that was actually the event that made Einstein a household name. He was famous in the scientific world before 1919, but outside of the physics world, the name Einstein only became known in 1919. Here's how the event was reported in the New York Times on November 10th, 1919. Lights all askew in the heavens, men of science, men, not women, more or less agog, more or less agog over results of eclipse observations. Einstein theory triumphs. Stars not where they seemed or were calculated to be, but nobody need worry. Book for 12 wise men. No more in all the world could comprehend it, said Einstein when his daring publishers accepted it. If we want to fact check these statements, I'd make the following criticisms. First, a, a, an improved version of this remark here is not that stars were not where they seemed or were calculated to be, but that where they seemed to be was not where they were expected to be, if you ignore gravity. Or if you like, where they seemed to be is not where they were calculated to be, if you ignore gravity. They were, the stars were where they were calculated to be, including the effects of gravity. As for this statement, at the end, no more in all the world could comprehend it, said Einstein. First of all, I'm sure Einstein never said any such thing. 
And secondly, it would have been grossly untrue since, as I told you, although there weren't many, there were some experts who understood Einstein's theory from the beginning. And in particular, Carl Schwarzschild discovered the first black hole solution almost as soon as the theory had been published. Now, what was Einstein's theory? Well, Einstein's theory was based on reinterpreting gravity in terms of the curvature of space-time caused by mass. So uh, this picture, which I took from Wikipedia, is a kind of cartoon that suggests the idea. But before I explain the cartoon, I want to also explain its limitation. It's very important in Einstein's theory that what is curved is space-time rather than space. But Unless one really studies the mathematics of Einstein's theory, it's very difficult to understand what's meant by saying that it's space-time rather than space that's curved. Even curved space might be hard for you to visualize, but you're all familiar with curved surfaces. For example, in this cartoon picture, the Earth is depicted as a ball that weighs down on an elastic surface like a trampoline. The surface is bent and makes a curved surface. So curved surfaces we are familiar with in everyday life. Um, the gap between this picture and the reality is the following. First of all, it's three-dimensional space that's curved, not just the, the two-dimensional surface as shown here. It does take more imagination and perhaps a little bit of mathematical background to properly understand what's meant by the curvature of three-dimensional space, as opposed to a two-dimensional curved surface as shown in this picture. But in any event, what's curved in Einstein's theory is not just three-dimensional space, it's four-dimensional space-time, three space and one time. It's definitely more difficult in everyday experience to imagine what is meant by saying that space-time rather than space is curved. Although if you learn the mathematics of Einstein's theory, you can calculate with it. It's very difficult to really develop intuition about curved space-time, but you can struggle and develop some partial intuition. What's uh, depicted in this picture is that space is envisaged as a two-dimensional surface. And the earth is seen as a ball resting on the surface and making it curved. And then you could imagine a marble rolling on the surface. If you set it in motion here with a velocity in this direction, it would tend to curve around the earth because of the way the surface is bent. And if the marble was a conscious being and you asked why it's going on a curved path, well, the right answer in Einstein's theory is that the marble is going on the most straight path that there is in a curved space-time. That remark is, well, well, to make that remark true, we need a somewhat, in the model, we need a somewhat better model than this one, the cartoon picture, where the earth is seen as a mass weighing on a trampoline seat. In the picture, the earth is being pulled down, I assume, by some object below down here. The earth pulls down, weighs down on the trampoline and bends it. In Einstein's theory, nothing else, the earth intrinsically because of its mass makes space around it curved. Nothing is pulling on the earth to cause that curvature. It's the earth itself, if you like, pulling on space that causes the space around it to be curved. It's the three space around the earth, not just a two dimensional surface that's curved. And even more, it's the four dimensional space time that's curved. So in the first movie that we saw, um, what was emphasized was what we would see if we were close to the LIGO event. If we were near the two orbiting black holes, first of all, we make the geometry visible by imagining stars in the distance that we're looking at. And then what we're actually seeing is the stars behind the black hole. The star images are moving around as the black holes move <clears throat> because of the fact that the space time around the black holes is curved. But the movie didn't show us the curvature. It simply showed us the result of the curvature, which was the motion of the star images from behind the black hole. The next movie is going to try to depict the curvature caused by the black holes. But it's impossible to make a movie that shows space-time curvature. And it's also even impossible to make a movie that shows three-dimensional curvature. So what will actually be depicted in the movie is a two-dimensional curved slice of the space, not space-time around the two black holes. And when you look at the movie, you'll see, actually, sorry, but don't start the movie quite yet. Uh, ah, sorry, okay, yeah, okay. 
there are two little black dots that you can see even before we start seeing the movie. Now those black dots are not part of the space. They're just meant to guide your eye about where the black holes are. And then as the movie starts, we're going to zoom in on this picture and you're going to see, please don't start the movie. Could you, well, okay. Yeah. As the movie starts, you're going to see that underneath the, well, where the black dot is, the space is going to take a dip. And the dip is actually the black hole. That dip is a sharp turn in the geometry of space, which is caused by the black hole. Well, in Einstein's theory, the dip itself is the black hole. But since that idea is somewhat difficult to grasp if you're not familiar with Einstein's theory, the movie makers have drawn these little black disks that aren't part of the space, but are meant to guide your eye. The dip that's underneath the black disk is really the black hole. What you're going to see in the movie is that the two dips in space are going to orbit around each other, get closer or deeper, and so on. So the movie is fairly faithfully depicting a two-dimensional slice of the curved space around the black holes. No one, I mean, one can't really make a movie with a good depiction of three-dimensional curvature. So they're showing a two-dimensional curved slice of a three-dimensional curved space. They're also not trying to depict the curvature of space-time which as I've said, is even harder to imagine. I think we could go ahead and play the movie now. So you see the little black dots just to guide the eye. Below the black dots are dips in space. The dips are really the black holes, the curvature caused by the black hole. And now we've zoomed in on the picture. The black holes are orbiting. They're emitting gravitational radiation and they're slowly getting closer. When we get the time that's depicted minus 0.3 seconds means 0.3 seconds before the merger. At 0.007 seconds, see, the two dips are getting closer as the black hole spiral in. And they're going to freeze the movie. This They freeze it at the moment where the gravitational wave signal gets so strong that it was detected on Earth. You see the two dips, the two black holes have almost merged. Okay. Okay, and now this is the last milliseconds. Okay, now, now the black holes have merged. There's only one black hole left, one dip with one black hole above it and go, spiraling going outward. They're depicting the gravitational wave signal going off into the distance and eventually reaching the earth a billion years later. Maybe we'll watch the movie. Okay, good, great. I wanted to suggest to watch the movie one more time. So as I've explained, it's the actual dips down here. Oh, you can't see, right? okay. You don't see my cursor during the movies, but it's the actual dips below the black disks that are the black holes. The disks drawn, maybe spheres I should call them rather than disks drawn above are just to remind you where the black holes are in space, but the dip itself is the space, is the black hole according to Einstein's theory. Now the black holes are merging into one. At minus 0.007 seconds, right now, the signal was detected on Earth. Oh, sorry. And now the black holes have merged and the waves go off to infinity. When I say right now, the signal was detected on Earth, what I mean is right now was emitted the signal that was detected on Earth a billion years later, 0.007 seconds before the final merger. The gravitational wave signal became strong enough to be detected with the LIGO detector as it was configured in 2015. By now it's a little more sensitive and they would have detected the signal a little bit earlier. I guess we could close the movie. So at the end of the movie, you hopefully saw the outgoing ripples that represent the gravitational waves. So why, does, well, why do these orbiting black holes emit gravitational waves? Well, if you move an ore in the water, you create water waves. And if you take an electrically charged body and shake it, you create electromagnetic waves, which become radio waves or even waves of visible light if the shaking is fast enough. According to Einstein, if you create a mass, you create gravitational waves. But Einstein and his contemporaries thought that this fundamental prediction of his theory would never be tested because gravitational waves interact so weakly. Gravity 
from the standpoint of a person who studies fundamental physics, gravity is the weakest force, meaning that at the level of individual atoms and subatomic particles, gravity is far weaker than the other forces. For example, the electromagnetic force keeps electrons and atomic nuclei bound together. But at the level of a single atom, gravity is completely negligible. The, the reason we notice gravity is that when we have a large body like the Earth or the Sun, the gravitational force of many, many atoms adds up and eventually makes a significant gravitational field. But gravity is still so weak that Einstein thought that gravitational waves would never be observed. So Einstein did not anticipate a lot of things. He didn't anticipate the technology that made LIGO possible, such as the invention of the laser and various other things. And he, but he also didn't anticipate the existence of such powerful sources of gravitational waves as the merger of two black holes. So I'm going to show another movie that emphasizes the gravitational waves that came out of the LIGO event. So here, the black holes are black dots. And in green, you see the, these green waves spiraling out are the gravitational waves initially faint, but they're going to become much more pronounced as the black holes spiral in. And so it's the last, it's the last six or seven ripples. I'll show you some data in a moment and you'll see that it's the last six or seven ripples that were actually detected in the LIGO detector. Okay. We'll watch it one more time. So um, as you watch the movie, Imagine, try to look with your eye the last six or seven ripples because that's what was actually discovered or observed. So the ripples get stronger and stronger until the black holes merge. When the black holes merge, the emission stops. It all dies down quickly. So the last six or seven ripples were observed. And in a moment, we'll actually see what the data looked like. So how strong was the gravitational wave created by this event? Well, there are different ways we could measure that. So one measurement is to ask how much energy was in this wave. So this symbol, and this symbol here is an astrological symbol for the sun. It was used by astrologers long before there was modern science. And when science, modern science was invented, astronomers kept over some of these symbols from astrology. The same was done in chemistry for some things. So M for mass with this symbol. This symbol represents the sun. So this symbol represents the mass of the sun. In the LIGO event, the two black holes had estimated masses of 29 solar masses and 36 solar masses. But the final black hole had an estimated mass of 62 solar masses. As you can see, a mass of three solar masses disappeared. What that actually means is that that amount of mass was converted into gravitational waves. The energy of the gravitational waves was three times mc squared, using Einstein's formula that energy is mc squared. So in ordinary terms, that's an enormous energy, something like 10 to the 57 ergs or 10 to the 50 joules. So like the energy of a 100 watt light bulb running for 10 to the 48 seconds or 10 to the 31 years. So, uh, sorry, let's hold off for a second on, on this um, the movie. So th that's one measure of how strong the signal was, how much its energy was. Another measure would be um, how much was space curved? So well, how would you measure that? Well, if you're sitting someplace and the gravitational waves goes by, you're going to get stretched and shrunk. Uh, if you're an elastic body, what happens depends on how strong you are. But if you've got two masses freely floating in space, the distances between them will change by an amount that's simpler to calculate. It's a dimensionless measure of the strength of the wave. If you're close to the black hole, the distances will be doubled in half, changed roughly like I'm showing you with my hands. But if you're 10 times farther, the distance between two bodies will only change by 10%. 
the Earth was roughly 10 to the 20 times farther from the black hole than the size of the black hole itself. And that meant that distances on Earth change only by 10 to the minus 20. So as the wave passes, everything on Earth tended to stretch up and down, but only by one part in 10 to the 20. A tiny, tiny imperceptible stretching and bending. So the next movie, well, it, it tends to make physicists uh, laugh because it's a wildly exaggerated cartoon of the gravitational wave passing, passing the earth and causing the earth to start vibrating. So it's wildly exaggerated in the sense that, well, it's closer to what would have happened if we were a million miles from the, a million kilometers from the event rather than where we actually were, which was a billion light years away. So uh, just for fun, the movie shows a wildly exaggerated cartoon of everything on earth being bent and stretched as the gravitational wave passes. So now we can watch this uh, wildly exaggerated cartoon. So the, the gravitational wave signal is coming in green. Th those green pulses come from, from the lower right represent the gravitational waves. They're causing the earth to start vibrating. If the earth was a fluid sphere and was just a million kilometers and not a billion light years away, uh, it would start vibrating wildly like you see here. Okay. So finally, this was seen by LIGO. So what is LIGO and how does it work? Well, uh, this is an aerial picture of one of the two LIGO detectors. There's one in Washington State. This is, that's this one. There's a second one, which is identical in Louisiana. And there's a third very similar detector uh, in Italy, the Virgo detector which started operating just a few months after this event was discovered. And an additional detector is being commissioned in Japan and a slightly longer term, one in India. The one in Japan is, uh, I forget the word, it's, it operates at very cold temperatures, which will increase the sensitivity. Anyway, having more detectors let you make a more accurate measurement of these events. But anyway, here's an aerial picture of one of the detectors. The way it works is the following. There's, this is the main experimental hole. There's a mirror here and here. These arms are each a few kilometers long. These arms I think are vacuum tubes. There's a laser beam bouncing up and down in here. It's also bouncing up and down in here. The laser wave bounces up and down here or here and then using something that is sort of called a half silvered mirror, the two beams are recombined and made to interfere using the jargon of physicists. If the two arms are exactly the same length, you arrange so that there's what's called negative interference and nothing reaches the detector. A gravitational wave causes a slight bending or stretching in one direction or the other, depending on which way the wave is oriented. When you slightly bend one arm relative to the other, you spoil the negative interference and a light signal does get to the detector. Now this bending is very, very tiny. The length of an arm is three kilometers. The bending is something like 10 to the minus 20 of three kilometers, which is a very, very tiny distance. Much, much less than the size of an atom, more like the size of an atomic nucleus. So we're measuring a, a very tiny change in in the distance, but that as the light bounces up and down many times, causing the effect to accumulate, then there also are many, many photons in each arm because very intense laser beams are using, used. The very slight change in length of one arm relative to the other. Ah, you're not, I'm using this nice cursor to point things out and you're not seeing it. Okay. You, your, your cursor was visible, Edward. We could see you your, were? yes. Can you see it now? Not now. It was visible oh. just before you. Oh, gosh. Okay. There is a uh, enable mouse pointer. You see it now, right? No, I don't see it now. You don't see it now? You were seeing it when you were showing up and down, going up and down the, the tunnel. That was visible then when you were doing that. Well, how about this? Is this visible? Right. Now we see it. We okay. see it now. Okay. okay. So 
So one beam is bouncing up and down this tunnel, one beam is bouncing up and down this tunnel. There's a tiny shift of one length relative to the, to the other, which gives each photon a tiny, tiny probability to eventually be this detected. But there are so many photons in the tunnels that that very, very tiny probability leads to a measurable signal. The reason that two detectors were built was that, well, there are all kinds of other things that can affect the length of the two arms. For example, there is seismic noise on the earth. There could be a truck rumbling by. Although this is, I think, in the desert, which cuts down on that. Uh, in the Louisiana detector, they're in a forest and trees being cut down by loggers, even at a considerable distance, cause vibrations that are significant. Anyway, there's all kinds of noise in both detectors. And to be sure that they had something, they wanted to see a simultaneous signal at two detectors thousands of kilometers apart. So finally, I'm showing real data. This is the data from the detector in Washington. And this picture shows data from both detectors. So just looking at the Washington detector, uh, well, 0.3 seconds before, so okay. the event, these waves here are the actual gravitational waves. Well, these six or seven oscillations are the signal of the event. Back here is actually before the gravitational wave event. And this shows you the typical noise level in the detector. Again, the typical noise level after. The six or seven oscillations that stand up as several times the typical noise level are the signal from the gravitational wave events. The, the second picture they show in blue, the signal from Livingston, Louisiana, superposed on the solution signal from Hanford, Washington, with only one correction. Because of the travel time, the gravitational wave travels at the speed of light. And it arrived in Livingston, Louisiana, a few milliseconds after Hanford, Washington. So they've displaced in time the Livingston signal to make it match up well, sorry, we, we, to make the two match up, they've displaced the time axis in Livingston relative to the Hanford signal. You can see that for six or seven oscillations, they match up very well. Back here, you are seeing the cursor now, aren't you, Kermit? No. Back here, they're not particularly, where they don't match up particularly, that's where we're mostly seeing noise again in the future. So this is the period where we're releasing a gravitational wave signal. At the What's bottom, it? what? Come in. No, okay. At the bottom, That's always... uh, at the bottom, they've taken um, a fit. Or, okay. They infer the parameters, the masses of the black holes and the, their orbit from the signal they observe. And the curves shown in red here and in blue here our best fits based on general relativity, based on Einstein's theory of gravity, to what this signal would look like. So the coincidence between what was seen in the two signals and the ability to reproduce it by Einstein's theory are the basis for the claim that a gravitational wave event was observed. So that's what I'm going to say about uh, the gravitational wave observation. And now we want to move toward discussing the uh, close-up picture of a black hole that was taken by the Event Horizon Telescope. But first, there's something else basic about how light interacts with the black hole that may be the one thing you know about black holes or knew before this lecture, but that I haven't explained yet. We're going to take another look, but I'm going to draw a different kind of picture. In this picture, time is depicted vertically and space runs horizontally. And I depict the black hole as an object that's just sitting there in space at all times. So at a given time, I've depicted the black hole as a disk in two space, although it's really a sphere in three space would be a better picture, hard to draw on the, on the two dimensional side. Sorry, I'm sorry for the confusion, but are you seeing the cursor now? Yeah, I think yes. you are. Okay. okay. So. To depict the idea that a black hole is at rest doing nothing, I've drawn a picture that's the same at all times. So we have a disk representing the black hole that's just sitting there for all times. Now, uh, I'm going to draw another picture that shows a light ray in empty space. So now the light ray is moving at the speed of light 
but I've chosen units so that the speed of light is represented by a 45 degree angle from the vertical. So in a unit time, the light ray travels a unit space and goes on a straight line in this picture where its position in space is changing in proportion to the elapsed time. And so a 45 degree angle represents the path taken by a light ray in space time. Now we're going to look at a light ray that's escaping from a black hole. When it's near the black hole, it slows down. So if it was not moving at all in space, if it stayed put at a constant position in space, it would be represented by a vertical line, the same space at all times. Instead, the light ray moves slower when it's near the black hole, but as it gets farther, it moves faster. When it's very far from the black hole, it moves at a 45 degree angle in this picture, like a light ray in vacuum. When it's close, it moves almost vertically because it's moving slowly in space. So a curved path like this in space-time is the path of a light ray escaping from near a black hole. Now, if the light ray is closer to the black hole, its path is more vertical and it takes longer before it starts to go away at a sharper angle. The slower, the closer the light ray is to a black hole, the slower it is to escape. Here's the path of a black hole that starts very close to the black hole. It eventually will go off at a 45 degree angle, but only if we continue the picture farther up to later times than I've drawn. One that's even closer will take even longer to escape. And at the surface of a black hole, which is called its horizon, the light ray simply stays still forever. So this vertical line that never escapes is meant to indicate a light ray that's on the surface of the black hole, on the black hole horizon, and just stays put at a constant position in space at all times. It never escapes. From the interior, a light ray would actually be drawn in. But of course, an observer at a distance, and we are outside the black holes that we're looking at, we'll never see the light rays that are inside that don't escape. What we see are the light rays that are outside that do escape. But the closer they are to the black hole, the more trouble they have escaping. So <clears throat> that's a different picture of the same process that leads to the bending of star images by a black hole. Now, could we take a real picture of a black hole rather than the movie simulations that I've shown? Well, what determines how big something has to be at a given distance so we can see it? And by seeing something, I mean that we want to be able to see something about it. We don't want to just see a point of light. In the language used by astronomers, we want to be able to resolve the object, to see it as something more than a point of light. Well, if you try to look at something in a straightforward way, using your lens, such as the lens of your eye, or the lens of a telescope, then the fundamental limit comes from the wavelength of light divided by the size of the lens. For instance, visible light has a wavelength of about 1 20,000th of a centimeter. Your eye has an aperture of about one third of a centimeter. When I say the aperture of your eye, I mean the aperture of your eye when your pupil is fully dilated. If you go outside to a very dark place, probably out in the countryside far from Tehran or far from Princeton, New Jersey, where I live, on a very dark night without a moon, a full moon will prevent this from happening, on a very dark light full, full from far from all lights, your pupil after a few minutes will be fully dilated to an aperture of about a third of a centimeter. Under those conditions, taking the ratio, we learned that your eye has an angular resolution under optimal conditions of about an 80th of a degree. Anything with this angular size smaller than an 80th of a degree will look just like a point, even under ideal conditions. For example, the planet Jupiter at its closest to Earth has an angular size, as seen from Earth, of about an 80th of a degree. If we're just a little bit bigger or closer, you could begin to resolve it with the naked eye. As it is, you're just barely beginning to resolve it under ideal conditions. So because we can almost resolve Jupiter with the naked eye, we can resolve it with even very simple telescopes, such as the one used by Galileo. So a very simple telescope suffices to resolve Jupiter as a disk rather than a point. And 
Um, the other bright planets, especially Mars, Saturn, and Venus, are, have almost equally large angular sizes seen from Earth. Well, within a factor of two or three at burst. So also a very simple telescope lets you resolve all the bright telescopes, all the planets Galileo knew about as disks. I think even Mercury, although it's harder for Mercury. Now, a very simple amateur telescope has a resolving power roughly 25 times better than the naked eye. So your eye is close to being able to resolve Jupiter. And a simple amateur telescope can resolve something whose angular size, well, 25 times Jupiter is a bit too small, but certainly 10 times smaller than Jupiter could be resolved by a simple amateur telescope. You might wonder how much better are the telescopes used by professionals? And the answer I think is slightly surprising. So the telescopes used by professionals are vastly better than a simple amateur telescope for seeing faint objects, but they're not as much better as you might think for resolving objects with a small angular size. That's because of the turbulence of the Earth's atmosphere, which places a limit that we didn't have to take into account for the simple amateur telescope, but it becomes important when you try to improve on the uh, turbulence or, or on a simple amateur telescope. So before the Hubble Space Telescope was launched, the best professional telescopes could see objects vastly fainter than an amateur could see, but could not do very much better at resolving small angular sizes. The Hubble was launched to get away from the turbulence of the Earth's atmosphere. And with the telescope in space, the Hubble telescope has a resolving power roughly 250 times that of the naked eye, meaning an object whose angular size is 250 times less than that of Jupiter at its closest is roughly the limit of what the Hubble Space Telescope can resolve. Now, since the Hubble was launched, tricks were developed whereby even telescopes on Earth can rival the Hubble under favorable conditions by using what's called adaptive optics. It's a trick by which you compensate for the turbulence of the Earth's atmosphere. Anyway, let's go back to our question of um, trying to take a picture of a black hole. But before we discuss the black hole, suppose we want to take a picture of a star and directly measure its size, or its apparent angular size as seen from Earth. To know its physical size, we also will need a way to measure its distance, but astronomers have such tricks. The star with the largest apparent size as seen from Earth is Betelgeuse with an angular size of 1 50, 50 millionth of a degree way too small even for the Hubble. Incidentally, Betelgeuse is not particularly close, but it's a star that's called a red supergiant. It's an enormous star way beyond the size of the sun. And so even though it's not particularly close, it has the largest apparent size of any star as seen from Earth. It's also one of the brightest stars in the sky. As a red supergiant, it's much brighter than the sun. And so it's one of the brightest stars and also the largest as seen from Earth. But it's way too small even for the Hubble. So, uh, well, Betelgeuse is a star that you've probably all seen, even from, I imagine even from Tehran, you can see it. Um, it's the upper right shoulder of the constellation Orion, Orion the Hunter. Well, it's, it's Orion's upper right shoulder. So as seen from, as in your view of Orion, it's the upper left shoulder. Actually, I gave a version of this lecture in New Zealand, and I had to figure out what, Betel what the constellation Orion looked like in the Southern Hemisphere, whether Betelgeuse was the lower left or lower right corner. But anyway, as seen in the Northern Hemisphere, it's the upper left corner of your picture of the constellation Orion, meaning it's the hunter's upper right shoulder. I, I didn't check, but I was curious what Betelgeuse is called in Farsi. I imagine it's an Arabic name. Lots of names used in English for bright stars come from Arabic. Maybe at the end, someone will tell you, tell me the name of the star in Farsi. Perhaps, I don't know, maybe somebody will help. Now, so Betelgeuse, although it has the largest angular size from 
to be seen from Earth is too, is too small to be resolved even by the Hubble. It's too small to be resolved by a telescope, well, by a single telescope. But there is a trick which is called interferometry. Using the wave nature of light, you can combine the signals collected by dis different telescopes and get a bigger resolving power than one telescope would have by itself. And then the resolving power in principle depends on the distance between the telescopes. So here's a picture of Betelgeuse. The picture was taken by the ALMA array in Chile. ALMA is an array of radio telescopes. I'll show you a picture of ALMA in a moment. But anyway, I wanted to show you what Betelgeuse looks like um, in this picture. So you can see some detail. This bump on the left is real, and this bright spot here is also real. Uh, it's not that well understood what we're seeing, but these things are real. So Betelgeuse was actually in the news in the last few years. I don't know if it was in the news in Iran, but for example, the New York Times had several articles on Betelgeuse. I think it was even on the front page once. The brightness of Betelgeuse fluctuated in a way that was so notable that if you, even with the naked eye, you could see it if you observe Betelgeuse over a few months. And it was quite a mystery what was going on. Its brightness dipped by a lot, but now Betelgeuse has more or less recovered. Anyway, here's a picture of the array, or at least part of the array. So these dishes are radio telescopes, and these two are probably of order 100 meters apart. But ALMA is an array of radio telescopes spread over seven meters, uh, sorry, several kilometers, I think close to seven kilometers. So we're only seeing a small part of the array here. With an array of tel radio telescopes uh, spread over seven kilometers, you can take this picture of Betelgeuse. And there are some other tricks that you can use, but this is the one that's most directly relevant for our story about taking a picture of a black hole. So as I said, Betelgeuse was in the news in the last few years. Now, before we go on, here's a question just for fun. So stars have an angular size way below the resolving power of the human eye. So why do bright stars look bigger than faint stars? First of all, I'm going to, I imagine you've all noticed this, but if you haven't, next time you're in a really dark place, maybe even in the city, but definitely if you're out in the countryside, if you look up at the sky, you'll certainly see that bright stars appear to be bigger than faint stars. But I've got bad news. It has nothing to do with the actual sizes or distances or apparent angular sizes of the stars. It's purely a question of the limitations of your eye. Uh, what's happening is the following. An ideal point source as seen by the eye won't look like a point. The light will be spread over a little disc or a little ball uh, because of that fundamental limit I mentioned that involves the wavelength of the light and the size of your eye's lens. The ball isn't a sharp ball. It's a smooth ball. It has a smooth boundary. And the apparent size of the star depends on how far into the tail of that distribution your eye can see. The brighter the source, okay, if you have a fainter source, your eye will see, your lens of the eye produces an image spread over the same, spread out in the same way. But how far into the tail of that distribution your eye can see depends on how bright the star is. So for a brighter source, your eye sees farther into the tail of the distribution and therefore the bright star looks bigger than a faint star. Jupiter is a borderline case because, as I said, uh, your eye is close to being able to resolve Jupiter. So under ideal conditions, the apparent angular size of Jupiter is a mixture of an effect due to its actual size and the limitations of your eye. Now let's go on and ask if we could take a picture not of a star, but of a black hole. Well, the largest known black holes as seen from Earth are two. One is at the center of the Milky Way and the other is at the center of a distant galaxy known as M87. M87 is about a thousand times as far as the center of the Milky Way. But as a rough cosmic coincidence, the black hole at the center of M87 is about a thousand times the mass of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. So it also is about a thousand times the true size. Since it's a thousand times farther and also a thousand times bigger, its apparent size as seen from Earth is about the same as the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. 
The Milky Way has a black hole with a mass of a few million solar masses. M87 has a mass, black hole with a mass of a few billion solar masses. It turns out, for a reason I'll explain later, it's easier to picture M87 than the Milky Way. So the, the picture we have as of now of a close up of a black hole is for the black hole in M87, not the one in the Milky Way. Now the name 87 is probably not familiar unless you're an amateur astronomer, but it's actually one of the easiest galaxies to observe from Earth. And here's a, well, a modern picture of M87. So M87 is what's called an elliptical galaxy. So it's basically round. It doesn't have those nice spiral arms that you see in some galaxies, but it's got a jet coming out from it. And this thing shown in blue is the jet. I'm not sure what's been done so that the butt jet looks blue in this picture. The jet, this little white dot is a kind of knot where that jet is particularly intense. But anyway, you can see this thing coming out of M87, which nowadays is called a jet. The jet from M87 was actually first imaged very nearly a century ago, just in the early days of general relativity, long before anybody took black holes seriously. So nobody knew what it was, but M87 had been seen as a fuzzy ball. And then by approximately a century ago, someone managed to take a picture of M87 that was good, a good enough picture that you could see this jet coming out. So in modern terms, the jet is interpreted. In modern terms, the understanding of M87 is that inside M87 is a spinning black hole there's matter swirling around the spinning black hole at the center of M87. The matter gets heated up and as it falls in and spirals in, it heats up. And the process is actually rather complicated, not well understood. But as the gas heats up, some of it squirts out and it preferentially squirts out along the spin axis of the black hole because roughly speaking, because the magnetic field that tends to keep the gas from escaping is weaker there. So preferentially from the very hot region around the black hole, energy and matter squirts out along this axis. It also squirts out in the opposite direction, but we see that much less as seen from Earth. And Earth, we on, from Earth in this picture, we only see the part of the jet that's coming roughly in our direction. It's not coming exactly in our direction. The jet is going off at an angle. If it were coming exactly in our direction, the jet would look more like a spot rather than the ray that you see in the picture. Now, the black hole has an angular size as seen from Earth about a thousand times less than Betelgeuse. So to take a picture of it needs an array of telescopes with about 1000 times the size of Alma. Now Alma has a size of about seven kilometers. So we need an array of telescopes with the size of roughly 7,000 kilometers. In other words, comparable to the size of the Earth. And that's, so you see, we need an array of telescopes working together with the size of the Earth. So such an array has actually been constructed. It's called the Event Horizon Telescope. It's a consortium of telescopes all around the Earth with sites in places like, gosh, I hope I've got them written in a moment, but some of them include Chile, Hawaii, the Canary Islands, Arizona, and a couple more that I think I've got written in a moment. So they all clock their signals and electronically you want to combine those signals and in the jargon you want to interfere with them. You want to add the signals and see an, an oscillation effect that has to do with the very fine details of the image and let you resolve things that a single telescope couldn't image. It's actually, these telescopes are collecting so much data that it's actually completely impractical to combine them in real time. So the data is actually stored in hard drives, thousands of hard drives, which are then physically brought together and recombined by computer long after the data is taken. The first, the first and still only picture of the black hole in M87 was published in 2019. And it's the only real picture we have of a black hole or more precisely its environment. So this is the picture. I expect most of you have seen it because it 
well, at least in the US, it was in all the newspapers when it was published in the spring of 1987. It's our first picture of the close environment of a black hole. Very roughly, this black dip is the black hole and the ring around it is the Einstein ring. What we're seeing roughly, well, we're, roughly what we're seeing is the hot gas of matter uh, around surrounding the black hole. But because of the way gravity works, the light from behind the black hole tends to be focused toward us while the light from in front of the black hole tends to be defocused. So we're seeing an approximate Einstein ring from the hot gas behind the black hole. Uh, the picture fits well, at least at a rough level, the predictions from general relativity. So the size of the ring and the size of the dip in the middle are a good match for what was expected from a black hole with the size and mass of the M87 black hole that had been inferred from other measurements. However, the details of the picture are not that well understood. So an obvious thing in the picture is that the ring is much brighter on one side than on the other. So it's believed that that has to do with a combination uh, of the rotation of the black hole and the distribution of matter around the black hole, but we don't understand in detail what the picture is showing. To understand it in more detail, we need a better picture. So you could ask, okay, this picture was based on telescopes in Chile, Arizona, Hawaii, Europe, and the South Pole. Yes, the South Pole was the important site I was forgetting. I, I mentioned the Canary Islands, which is at least one of the European sites. So the South Pole is important because it's far away from the others. And to do well with interferometry, you want the telescopes as far away from each other as you can get them. And it's better to have a variety of telescopes in different places. You can improve on it with more telescopes and there's a planned upgrade with a new telescope in Greenland. And you can also uh, do a little better by using radio waves of somewhat shorter wavelength. That's, it's technically harder to do this at shorter wavelengths, but it's possible to go to somewhat shorter wavelengths. And that will make a somewhat sh sharper picture. So in the next few years, we can expect a picture, I think, maybe twice as sharp as this one. And as the, uh, as the matter around the black hole orbits around it, a picture taken later will look different. So we eventually will get pictures of M87 taken from different angles, in effect, as the matter around the M87 orbits it. We also hope to take pictures of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way even though it has the same apparent size as the black hole in M87, because it's smaller, um, the matter orbiting it is orbiting much faster. And the, what you see in a picture of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way is expected to change from hour to hour, rather than from, or maybe even faster than hour to hour, sorry, I'm slightly forgetful at the moment. But the picture at the center of the, of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way changes so fast that it's actually harder to do this. So they don't yet have a picture of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, but um, we hope to have such a picture before long. So we can do somewhat better with the new telescope in Greenland and buzzing radio waves of somewhat shorter wavelength. For a big improvement, we can go to space. If you add it to the Event Horizon Telescope, um, a telescope in space, for example, a telescope on the far side of the moon or simply a telescope in Earth orbit at a considerable distance, you could get a much sharper picture and possibly a much more precise test of the predictions of general relativity. This picture tests in a complicated way, Einstein's theory plus the details of the matter near the black hole. So a sharper picture would let us, well, learn more about Einstein's theory, but also learn more about what there is near the black hole. If you want a pure test of Einstein's theory, not affected by the details of matter around the black hole, it's been shown that, for example, with a telescope on the far side of the moon, working together with the ones we have on Earth, you'd be able to image some fine details of the picture, which don't depend on the details of the matter and only depend on Einstein's theory. So in principle, you can do much better in testing Einstein's theory with the telescope in space. 
So I'm going to end this talk with one more movie. And this movie will be a simulation of what we would see when a black hole passes through a galaxy, if we could live for hundreds of thousands of years to watch the events. So this is going to see a galaxy is tens of thousands of light years across. The black hole is moving with only a mildly relativistic velocity in the movie, a couple tenths of the speed of light. So the movie unfolds over a duration of hundreds of thousands of years. So if you could see a black hole passing through, through a galaxy, live for hundreds of thousands of years, what happened? This is what you'd see. Before we watch the movie, let's talk about what we see at the beginning before it starts. Here's the galaxy. Here's the black hole. The black hole is black, but you're seeing a ring around it. The ring is actually the light from the galaxy. So a light ray from the galaxy could pass by the black hole on the far side. If it passes near the black hole, it can be bent toward you. So you actually see a ring that's brighter on the, on the side distant from the black hole than on the near side. Because although a light ray could be deflected toward you from either side of the black hole, it's actually, the light is amplified if it goes around the black hole on the far side before being bent toward you. So this is what we see when the black hole is some distance from the black hole. As the, the black hole in the movie is going to pass toward the galaxy, it'll distort the image of the galaxy. And as the black hole approaches, the light from the near side of the galaxy will become brighter. So anyway, now we can watch the movie. So the near image is brightening. And as the black hole goes away, again, you see the light primarily on the far side from the galaxy. This movie will play again in a second. So this is well, a black hole passing through the Milky Way would look somewhat like this. If you were at a distance of a few tens of thousands of light years, and you could live for a few hundred thousand years to watch it. So, um, I guess that's what I have to offer today. To summarize, I've tried to tell you a little bit about black holes and Einstein's theory. And I've also told you a little bit about the modern observations of black holes, which have made black holes much more concrete than they were for decades when the, the evidence for their existence was so indirect. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Edward, uh, for this beautiful talk. Uh, and. Uh... Uh, we have to, uh, we have time for questions. So people who want to ask questions, please raise your hands. And uh, uh, the the structure of the question and answer would be as follows: Please ask uh, only one question, and if you have more than one question, you can raise your hand again and you go to this. You cycle through the to the queue. So uh, and if you if you could, if it's possible, uh, when you ask your question, could you turn on your video? And uh, and ask your question. So we'll go according to the order of the uh, order of the hands raised. Uh, just one uh, one thing I noted: people writing on the chat uh, answering uh, its question about Beetlejuice in, uh, in in Arabic. It's called, if I can pronounce it correctly, I'm not sure. Avatar Joza, uh, which in Farsi they also have other names like Shaban Shani. So I'm, I'm I, I heard people writing these on the chat, which I'm just um, quoting. Yeah. Thank you. So it's, uh, I'd wondered, many, many Arabic names of bright stars are used in English. And I just wondered if Farsi might be the same, but I see you have your own tradition, at least for Well, them. during the period of the, the, uh, the time where these names were made, of course, many in Iran were speaking Arabic in the scientific community. So th that was the same words that they would be using back then as well, anyhow. But I think the modern Persian, they also have other names for it, I think. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So anyhow, so we'll be we'll be taking questions now. So the first question is from Benjamin Tusi. I'm I'm uh, I'm going to turn on your uh, your camera and your uh, your uh, your uh, um, your audio, so you can go ahead with asking your question. I think I all uh, who did I turn on now? I changed somebody else. Uh, well, I don't. I think I'm turning on somebody else's now because of that person. The first person who was there, someone has disappeared. Oh, so, that's me. I'm Sohrab. Yeah, okay. Sohrab, please go ahead with your question. Uh, thanks so much for your interesting uh, talk. I really enjoyed and learned a lot of things from your talk. I have Thank a you. question about this one of these uh, movies that you demonstrated about this okay. uh, merging black holes. And in the last moment of this merging, there was a burst of the gravitational wave. 
and uh, that triggered the questions to me that uh, uh, I wonder if the strong uh, time variation of the metric just at the, la at the last moment of merging can uh, excite the, the other uh, fields in the, in the standard model and also can produce the particles at that moment. So that's a good question. The question is, would the black hole merger produce other signals like electromagnetic signals and so on? Or even more extreme signals, could you produce electrons more, and positrons, for example? So according to theory, a sufficiently small black holes would indeed produce other signals. But for such large black holes, the effect is very tiny. And astronomical black holes are too big to make a detectable signal. It's a shame because uh, for people in my line of work, being able to see the other particles produced by a black hole merger would be very important. And it's unfortunately out of reach. But it's a good question. So in principle, yes, but in practice, no, not a, not a detect detectable signal. OK, thank you. Thank you. Sure. So next question is by Erfan Abedi. Please go ahead. Hello, can you see me? Hi. Yes. Hi. Uh, professor, uh, I, my understanding, of, thank you for a great talk, first of all. Uh, secondly, uh, my current understanding of the black holes are that they're symmetric. They're like a circle or a sphere or something. The picture mm -hmm. that you showed from the M87 black hole, uh, it uh, had a kind of asymmetry that it was perceived to me at least. So, you know, uh, the way I saw it, you know, it was like uh, distorted in some way. So uh, is, this, yes. is that because of the matter surrounding it or, you know, the matter behind it that the Einstein ring or is it, uh, or is it something else to it that just distort, distorts our view? Well, as I said, that's another that's good another question. question. As I said, um, we, we don't really know the answer. To really understand what's happening, uh, we need sharper pictures. But let me make a few comments. So the black hole solution that Schwarzschild discovered in 1915 was spherically symmetric. And that's by far the easiest one to understand. But um, a, a black hole could be rotating. And I showed a picture of a man, Roy Kerr, who in 1962 discovered, uh, I said, a second astrophysically important black hole solution, but I didn't explain what it was. Kerr discovered the solution for a rotating black hole. And a rotating black hole is actually symmetric, but it's not spherically symmetric. It has a preferred axis. And that's believed to be important in the fact of, that it emits jets. So the jet coming out of M87, it's believed that it comes out along the axis of spin of the black hole. <clears throat> now, getting so there's an asymmetry that's believed to be caused by the spin of the black hole. But in addition, the matter around the black hole is in an unknown configuration, unknown except for this picture, and believed to not be perfectly symmetric. So it's believed that the asymmetry in the picture is a combination of the spin of the black hole and the distribution of matter around it. But to untangle that from just this one picture, which is barely sharp enough to begin to resolve what's happening, isn't possible. So we need more in order to understand better what's going on. But I'd like to say that in answer to your question is that black holes, a black hole that is settled down after being disturbed is actually symmetric. It's spinning. It, it could be spinning. It's not necessarily spherically symmetric. The black hole can have a spin axis. And unfortunately, spinning black holes are much harder to understand than spherically symmetric black holes. If one takes a course in general relativity, one gets a pretty good understanding of spherically symmetric black holes. But speaking for myself, spinning black holes are much harder to understand. Thank you. Thank I you so much. Extremely now, I'm personally extremely frustrated that it's so hard to understand spinning black holes. Thank you. Um, sure. So the next question is by Benjamin Tusi. I'm going to turn on your audio and, and the video. Please go ahead, Benjamin. Hello, Mr. Ritten. Uh, thanks for your interesting uh, speeches. Iron, you said that uh, the gravity is the weakest uh, force in the fundamental forces. I want to know that why is the reason of that? Well, that's something uh, Kermon, our host today, among others, has worked on. So there might be glimmerings of a fundamental explanation in the fact that it appears to be true in string theory and so on. 
but that's a bit of a mystery. Um, the answer every physicist would accept is that it's an experimental fact. So as far as experiment goes, gravity is much weaker than the other forces. I want to say though that that's a little bit circular because gravity is so weak that the only reason we know about it is that it's additive. All particles have positive mass or at least positive energy and everything with mass makes a contribution to gravity of the same sign. So if you have many, many particles together like in the earth or the sun, the gravity adds up. And although we can't observe the gravity of a single atom or particle, we can observe the gravity of the earth or the sun. If you had a force as weak as gravity, but it tended to cancel between the different particles, we would actually not know about that force. So electromagnetism can cancel. There are positive charges and negative charges and their effects tend to cancel. So the gravitational force of the earth due to the earth is bigger than the electrical force due to the earth because of an almost perfect cancellation of electricity between all the positive and negative charges in the earth while the masses add gravitationally. So it's true that experimentally gravity is the weakest known force, but it's also true that any force anywhere near as weak as gravity, which tended to cancel, would not be known. So what we really know from experiment is a little bit tricky. Yeah, thanks a lot. To summarize the answer to, to, the answer to your question, it's an observed fact experimentally, and there are gl glimmerings perhaps of theoretical explanation of why gravity is weaker than other forces. Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, why, because of that uh, gravity is so weak, how can the gravity of black holes make a change in the, uh, change on the lights and uh, uh, and taking into the black holes? Well, black holes are very little compared to their mass. So gravity at the level of, an, okay, take an atom. Now, <clears throat> Oh, take the Earth, let's say. The gravitational field of the Earth is never much stronger, nowhere much stronger than it is at the surface. You could go inside the Earth, but the gravity of the Earth wouldn't get much stronger when you go inside, because if you tunnel down, the matter above you would tend to pull you up. The matter below you tends to pull you down, but the pull would not be much stronger than it is at the surface, because you no longer have this adding of all the effects. Some matter would be pulling up, some down. So if you wanted to make the gravitational field of the Earth stronger, you'd have to shrink the Earth. Then you could go down to the surface and it would be stronger than the gravitational field of the actual Earth. The more you would shrink the Earth, keeping its mass fixed, the stronger would be the gravitational field at its surface. If you could shrink the Earth to a size of a few centimeters, it would become a black hole and the gravitational force at, field at the Earth's surface would be very strong. Einstein knew this, but the idea of shrinking an object with the size of the Earth to, uh, sorry, the idea of shrinking an object with the mass of the Earth to a size of a few centimeters sounded so silly that Einstein considered it science fiction and did not take black holes seriously. A black hole is like an object with the mass of the Earth that's been squashed to a size of a few centimeters. Or in the case of this black hole from M87, or possibly, I'm not totally sure if you're seeing it right now, but anyway, in the course, in, in the case of yes. this block, yes, it's uh, visible. Okay, that we're seeing in M87, it has not the mass of the Earth, but a billion or six billion times the mass of the Sun. And it's been squashed not to a few centimeters, but to uh, uh, roughly the size of the solar system. So if you if you squash a billion, uh, the mass of a billion suns to roughly the size of the solar system, its gravity becomes strong. But Einstein couldn't imagine anything with a mass of a billion suns. Thank or you. for one example, you could squash the sun to a few kilometers that would make a black hole. Again, Einstein couldn't imagine anything that would squeeze the, the sun to a mass size of a few kilometers. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. And can you please give access to download this file, the black hole? Yes, you're going to let me download it. No, I don't yes. have access to do that. Yes, they'll provide the links where you guys actually probably can download. 
Okay, so the next question is by Ali Mukhtari. I will turn on your audio and video. Please go ahead, Ali. Ali Mukhtari, your 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 the next question. Please go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. We can hear Hello. Yeah. Hello, thank you so much for your talk, Professor Vitan. So my question uh, might not be directly related to this talk, but it's uh, I, I was always I always wanted to ask this question from you, and now I got this opportunity to ask. So my question is about the uh, what is your opinion about the fundamental nature of the space and gra space time and gravity? Because there are two points of view in string theory and ADS CFD. One point one view is that uh, gravity is a fundamental force with a string of a spin two, and the other one comes from Van Ramstein model or a Willing Day model that gravity might emerge from the decrement of the entanglement entropy either in the CFD in a boundary or the space-time constituents in a Willing Day model. So which uh, point, which view do you think more promising and why not the other? Well, the second view is an attempt at a deeper explanation of what the first gives. So uh, I think that, for example, I think the Van Romsdonk model, for example, is very interesting. But it's a tentative model. It's meant to be not just not so much an explanation of anything as an inspiration for what an explanation might be. So, Van Ramsdonk model is fascinating, but it's work in progress. Uh, I think there's a deeper reality we don't understand, and I'd say the Van Ramsdonk model and similar things are one of the more interesting attempts we have to get at what that deeper picture might be. Hard to say more now. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. So next question is by uh, Aida Rasulian. I have turned on uh, your uh, your audio and video, Aida. Please go ahead. Oh, sorry. Hello. Can, Hi. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for your interesting talk. And uh, so some people think black holes, uh, real black holes, can't actually form because, from the point of view of an asymptotic observer, the process of collapse takes an infinite amount of time, at least classically. And some argue that quantum mechanically the situation is different. I just wanted to ask your viewpoint on this. <clears throat> well, um, well, I, I think by now it's pretty clear that black holes exist as objects that uh, actually exist in the heavens. And we've seen, we even have a picture of a close up picture of a black hole. And we've also seen the gravitational waves they emit when they collide. So black holes really exist. Now, your first comment was that, um, as seen by the outside, the infalling matter becomes fainter and fainter. Classically, okay, well, you asked two very good and very big questions, so it's hard to answer completely. But the first question was this, well, okay, something I didn't explain, but which is true and which you alluded to. The infalling, suppose you're able to watch a black hole form and we unfortunately are not able to. So we've gotten the observations of black holes that I've showed you, but well, we might be able to see a gravitational wave signal from a collapsing star producing a black hole. And that would give us an observation of the formation of a black hole. There's a realistic chance that the LIGO observatory will show us a signal from an event where a black hole is forming. Now, as you've said, according to theory, if you could see that event in great detail, the infalling matter would get fainter and fainter. Classically, it would never completely disappear, but it would get fainter and fainter. Quantum mechanically, it would completely disappear because you only see things in photons and there would be a last photon that would come out from the infalling matter. So classically, the infalling matter would completely disappear after a certain time. However, we're not going to be able to test that because even if LIGO does uh, observe a signal from an event in which a black hole is formed, you'd only be able to get a rather limited picture of the early stages of that event. But your description is correct according to theory. Could you repeat the part of your question about quantum mechanics? Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you. And um, so my concern is that is it correct that if we can say that the, the collapse process uh, is has taken place when matter has fallen to the vicinity of the black hole with proper distance, for instance, L Planck and fades away as you mentioned uh, was it clear not quite oh, well, sorry. i think yes well, the, 
Well, let me make a comment, and then if you want to ask sure. for the question, sorry. So, um, classically, classically, the, imagine a black hole forming in empty space. The simplest case is spherically symmetric collapse to a black hole as described originally by Schwarzschild. Classically, the infilling matter gets fainter and fainter, but never disappears to the outside observer. Quantum mechanically, it will completely disappear because the last photon will come out, and you won't see more after that. But quantum mechanically, the black hole will never become completely dark because as Hawking explained, yes. there will be quantum emission of radiation from the black hole. And that will continue indefinitely very on a very, very long time scale, much longer than the age of the present universe. A black hole in vacuum with the size of the black hole that we see in this picture would, ev would shrink and evaporate. For that really to happen, the black hole really has to be in vacuum or at least very close to vacuum. The black hole that we're seeing in M87 is not in vacuum. It's surrounded by hot gas, some of which is falling in. And the energy released when the gas falls in is creating the jet that goes out. I showed a picture of the jet coming out of M87. That jet is prominent enough that it was first photographed a century ago, as I remarked. So the black hole in M87 is far from being in a vacuum. So whatever Hawking says about what a black hole would do quantum mechanically in vacuum is overwhelmed by the fact that there's matter around the black hole that's still spiraling in today. So the black hole is actually growing today as it absorbs matter. So it's not shrinking quantum mechanically. So you've raised a number of interesting and important points about what would happen for a black hole in vacuum. But in the real world, in the real world, there's never a perfect vacuum. There is starlight, there is the 21 centimeter radiation left over from the Big Bang. And for all these things actually, than whatever are the fine details of what would happen for a black hole in vacuum. Yes. Um, uh, I probably haven't completely answered your question. So if there's a follow up, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm taking too much time. Uh, so uh, the question, actual question is if, can we say if some matter is falling towards a black hole, the collapse from the, from the point of view of distant observer has ended if it takes, it gets closer to the black hole than uh, Planck distance, for instance? Well, well, you're right to ask what happens at the Planck distance, but... Um, <clears throat> I mean, the membrane, yes. If you're interested in a practical question, like what we actually see when we look at a black hole in this picture, we're seeing light emitted at a much bigger distances than that. But you are correct that you can set up a theoretical question where you could say something like what you're saying. What you're saying, the Planck distance is, go is going to come in for thought experiments which are quite different from the actual observations I talked about in the lecture. With that said, though, you're raising important questions about thought experiments. I think it's hard to go into it more deeply right now, though. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the next question is by Mohammed Kazami. Mohammed, please uh, go ahead with your question. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 But first, thank you for your great presentation. I have a question about black holes. I guess that they should get heavier as they swallow more mass. Yes. But I think they don't last forever and evaporate after a long time. So what happens well, to the mass inside the black hole? Well, the, I kind of answered partly in answering the last question. question. So a black hole in vacuum, according to Hawking, would emit radiation and lose mass at a very, very tiny rate. So for the black hole that's pictured here in M87, the time for it to shrink by emitting Hawking radiation, if it was in vacuum, would be much longer than the age of the present universe, much, much longer. I don't have the number in my head, but many orders of magnitude longer. How do this black hole is not in vacuum? In the real world, it's very hard to get at such a perfect vacuum that Hawking's prediction is applicable. This black hole is surrounded by accreting matter. So it's actually gaining mass from the accreting matter much faster than it's radiating. You could ask, uh, what should be the mass of a black hole so that Hawking's effect will dominate? As a black hole gets smaller, its Hawking process becomes faster. It emits radiation at a higher temperature, according to Hawking. And for a sufficiently small black hole, um, 
you could treat it as being approximately in vacuum and it will be losing energy. So a question you could ask is what's the mass of a black hole that would have evaporated completely by the Hawking process within the age of the present universe? I don't have the number in my head, but it's something like the mass of an asteroid. Now, astronomically, we don't know how to make black holes with the masses of asteroids. Collapsing stars make black holes with solar masses. And the centers of galaxies contain black holes with masses of millions or billions of solar masses. As far as we know, there aren't any black holes in the real universe with masses less than a solar mass. But there could be. For example, they could have been created in the Big Bang. If the Big Bang created black holes with asteroid-type masses, then they are evaporating right now. And at the late stages of their evaporation, they would produce bursts of gamma rays, which we could observe if it happened close enough to Earth. We'd have to be extremely lucky for such black holes to be produced in the early universe in sufficient numbers that we could observe it. But in principle, it's possible. So in principle, black holes could be evaporating in today's universe, but they aren't the black holes we actually know about for sure in the sky. Thank you for your answer. Sure. Yeah. So <clears throat> next question is by Fatima. Fatima, I have turned on uh, your uh, audio and video. Please go ahead with your question. Uh, we can't hear you, Fatima. Can you? There's some problem with the audio. We can't hear you. You probably need to unmute. Maybe you can directly speak to your speaker because you take your speaker out. We can't still hear you. Okay, so maybe, maybe you can try to fix it while we go to the next question and then we come back to you. How about that? Okay. Uh, so the next question then would be by uh, Mohammad Bakhshande. Mohammad, please go ahead with your question. <clears throat> Mohammad, are you there? Your audio and video are both on. Please go ahead with your question. I, we can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, now we can. Um, uh, first of all, thank you, Mr. Witten, for the great uh, speech you had. I wanted to ask that, um, uh, what does it mean when we say uh, a uh, black hole starts to uh, evaporate? What does it mean? Well, Hawking demonstrated that a black hole in quantum theory is not completely black. A black hole in vacuum would emit particles. So particles such as photons, electromagnetic radiation, at a rate that's very small for a large black hole. It's larger for a smaller black hole. So a black hole in vacuum would lose energy by emitting Hawking particles. As it loses energy, it would shrink. This process where a black hole shrinks, losing energy and mass, was called evaporation by Hawking. So people call it black hole evaporation. It's a theoretical process that certainly hasn't been observed. <clears throat> and it's very hard to observe because for black, as I said in a previous answer, for black holes of realistic astronomical masses, it's a very, very tiny effect. To make it observable, you could dream that there are primordial black holes possibly created in the Big Bang, or anyway, black holes whose origin we don't know about that could be much closer to Earth and much smaller. And then futuristically, or even in the near future, if we were very lucky, it's conceivable we could observe the Hawking effect. But for these astronomical black holes, like the ones that actually figured in my lecture, it's unrealistic to observe the Hawking effect. Um, yes, uh, that's right. And uh, another question is that, uh, does gravity uh, affect the moving of all kind of waves or is, uh, is just that only light? It oh, the beauty of, of Einstein's theory is that it's universal. It affects everything. Uh, yes. It doesn't I mean, affect everything in the same way, but uh, under ideal conditions, gravity, at, at what's called long wavelengths, gravity, roughly speaking, affects everything in the same way, depending only on its energy momentum. Uh, yes, and the last one is that, um, does gravity depend on density? Because uh, we sometimes say that we have a lot of mass and we have a little volume so that we have a lot of gravity. Is that right? Gravity depends on the density of energy and momentum. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you very much.
technically the stress tensor. Yeah. yeah sure. Thank you. So the next question is by Amir. Uh, Amir, please go ahead with your question. We cannot hear you, Amir. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Sorry, I'm following with my mobile phone and uh, simultaneously in my laptop. I'm on the lap. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Perfect. Uh, sorry, I'm following with my mobile phone. I can see my. So let me ask my question uh, very fast because I see the feedback of my sound. Uh, so uh, the question is. Ignore your feedback and just ask your question. Please. Uh, okay. Uh, the question from the Edward Witten would be from my side as experimental physicist. Uh, what would be your opinion about the detection possibility of the string in any form that you described in your theories as a father of? Uh, string theory so there are lots of theories for how we can detect the dark matter dark energy is it possible it's not possible so finally it was possible to do detection for what it was kind of impossible in the past decades ago as you said but what about this string you know out of the earth uh, on the earth and such kind of phenomena is it possible to be observed somehow in the future out of the, earth. Well, the usual answer, okay. Uh, there's a down to earth answer, and then there's a slightly whimsical answer. The down to earth answer is that one hopes that um, <clears throat> by further advances in fundamental physics, for example, observations of new particles or new forces at accelerators, we'd learn more about the way the world works and possibly be able to make a prediction based on a, a string model. But I want to give you the other answer just for fun which is that if you're an optimist and the ability to do this depends on the de details of the string model, it's conceivable to observe a string in the sky as a cosmic string, because in some string compactifications, the strings that I study uh, come in all sizes as stable objects and there could be a large one created in the Big Bang that you'd observe in the sky as a, as a cosmic string, possibly as a source of gravitational waves or directly imaging it because it would def deflect the light behind it. Or if you're even more lucky, maybe it's superconducting and has electromagnetic effects. Anyway, the answer to your question is that people in my field are hopeful that one way or another, more advances in, more experimental advances in fundamental physics, as well as better theoretical advances, understanding the theory better, will make it possible to confront theory and experiment. For now, what we have, the main motivation for the excitement in string theory is that string theory offers a framework where we can unify Einstein's theory with quantum mechanics, which in the main framework of physics is not possible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so I think that I have, I don't see any, oh, I have see, I don't see any more questions, but I have one, I guess Fatima oh. was asking a question. I don't see. If she wants, you. the person who couldn't ask you could see if she's. Yeah, I don't know her name uh, on the list. I don't see her list. I, she seems to not be on the list anymore. I don't know where she went. Uh, if any of the organizers see her on the list, please turn it on for her. But uh, meanwhile, I will ask you a question from you, Edward. So, uh, I mean, people uh, usually are scared, some of them, about black holes being nearby. And uh, first of all, what is your comment on that? And secondly, I know that you recently wrote a paper about black holes, which are not, which may be not too far away from us. If you could comment on those, that'd be great. Yeah, well, that paper was a little bit fun, but it was uh, something that's not too likely to pan out. But the background is the following. First of all, in the last 20 years or so, um, okay, okay, you probably all know about the planet Pluto, which is about 5 billion kilometers from the sun, or at least it was traditionally called a planet. Nowadays, Pluto is regarded as a dwarf planet but it's the first of a large collection of small bodies in the outer solar system, 
making up what's called the Kuiper belt. By now, dozens of these bodies have been found. Some of the others are almost as big as Pluto. And the bodies found in the Kuiper belt, there's an asymmetry in their distribution, which is a little bit puzzling. It might be a statistical fluke. It also might be a selection effect because it's easier to search for Kuiper belt. For these Kuiper belt objects are very faint. It's easier to search for them in some directions in the sky than others. So an asymmetry in the distribution of these bodies could come because it's easier to find them where it's easier to look. It also could come because of chance, but maybe there's a maybe it's a real effect and there's a real reason for it. It's been suggested by, uh, I think, Michael Brown and others at Caltech that there's a body with roughly five to 10 times the mass of the earth at a distance of about four or 500 astronomical units from the sun. An astronomical unit is the distance of the Earth from the sun, roughly 10 to the eight kilometers. So this body is supposed to be 400 times as far from the sun as the Earth. And anyway, if you assume the existence of such a body way out there in the Kuiper belt, its gravitational influence affecting the other Kuiper belt objects would lead to a clustering of the orbits that's somewhat like what's observed. So they claim there's some evidence for what they call planet nine. Personally, I think that Pluto should, should have been grandfathered in and should still be called a planet. So I'd have called it planet X or planet 10, but they call it planet nine. Now it hasn't been found. It's believed that if it exists and is a conventional body, uh, it'll eventually be found within a few years, if not earlier than by this new survey telescope that will be operating in Chile in a few years, the Vera Rubin Observatory. But anyway, for, for now, there's some evidence that this body exists and it hasn't been found. Well, if it really exists, okay, suppose it, suppose the evidence, indirect evidence for it becomes stronger as more Kuiper belt objects are found, but we don't see it with our telescopes. Well, what's going on? Well, it was pointed out by a couple of young physicists and my, I'm forgetful in the names, I'm afraid, sorry. I wasn't expecting this to come up today, so I didn't brush up. Onwin is one author. I don't remember the other right now. A couple of young physicists suggested that planet nine exists, but it's a primordial black hole. So if that's true, could we observe it? Well, the search is going on for planet nine, couldn't find it. I suggested a rather whimsical way you might search it with a, a fleet of miniature spacecraft. But there's been another perhaps more practical suggestion for how to observe it, which is that there would be occasional gamma ray bursts when it swallows a comet because something else about the outer solar system that maybe most of you don't know is that it's believed that there are roughly 10 to the 12 comets orbiting the sun at a huge distance. The reason, reason that's observed is that on an average of once a year, we see a new comet coming into the inner solar system. A new comet that's orbit shows that it was never there before. And it's believed what's happening is that there's a huge reservoir of 10 to the 12 comets in the outer solar system. Every year by chance, one of them is scattered inward and we see it. So occasionally planet nine, if it's a black hole would swallow one of these comets and emit a gamma ray burst. Anyway, it's a fascinating, well, I tend to be conservative on such things. So my guess is that planet nine doesn't exist. If it does exist, it's probably made from ordinary matter. But, you know, if you're stuck inside during a pandemic and you want to dream, you can dream that planet nine exists and it's a primordial black hole. As I said, in answer to some previous questions, you can make semi, well, as I, I didn't quite say this, but you can make reasonably plausible models where black holes would have been formed in the early universe, a population of primordial black holes. If you want to dream, you can dream that one of those primordial black holes is out there 400 astronomical units from the black hole, sorry, from the sun. And if so, hopefully we'll eventually observe it. Thank you. I'll say one more thing. If, if that is there, you could ask, could the Hawking radiation, the Hawking effect, con effect of black holes be observed for this black, holes, black hole? It's still quite a challenge, but it's not completely out of the question. You'd have to send a space probe with a highly capable radio telescope uh, to the vicinity of the black hole. I'm not sure, nobody's done a serious calculation to try to imagine how a century from now you could test the Hawking effect if this object is really a black hole. But 
without having done a careful calculation. I think it's imaginable. It's at least as imaginable as it was when Einstein started to, to uh, discover gravitational waves. And this is part of the answer I might've given to one of the questioners who asked how string theory could be tested. Einstein predicted gravitational waves but thought the prediction would never be tested. It took a century and all kinds of discoveries before that was tested. Thank you. Uh, so next question by Artin uh, Tari. Please go ahead, Artin. I'll turn on your audience. Hello, Mr. Vita. Uh, thanks for, first of all, thanks for your amazing performance. And my question is that how did Einstein understand that gravity works by the curves in the space? How did he understand it? How did uh, Einstein understand uh, that gravity works by the curves in the space? Okay. Well, I'm not sure exactly how to interpret the question. One question you could ask is, what made Einstein think he should describe gravity in terms of space-time curvature? Yes, um, I think that is can be my question. Okay, so Galileo had discovered that objects of different mass fall toward the sun, sorry, fall in a gravitational field at the same rate. Okay. Famously, he's supposed to have dropped objects of different mass from the top of the leaning tower of Pisa, demonstrating that they fall, arrive on the Earth at the same time. It's not totally clear whether that's a real story or an apocryphal one, but regardless, Galileo discovered and actually observed in several different ways that objects fall regardless of their mass at the same rate. Okay. For centuries after Einstein, there was no deeper explanation of this fact. Newton incorporated it in his theory, but did not have a deeper explanation. Einstein understood that if the orbit of a particle in space in a gravitational field was determined by the curvature of space-time, then gravity would be universal, and all objects, regardless of their composition, would travel in the same orbit, assuming they had the same initial position and velocity. Thanks. So that was Einstein's insight about how to explain Galileo's observation. So it took three centuries after Galileo's observation before there was a fundamental explanation. Trying to explain Galileo's observation made Einstein postulate that gravity was described by curvature of space-time, and then it took him another six or seven years to invent the math. Thanks, me. Thanks a lot. Sure. Um, I don't see any more questions, so if there are no more questions, uh, let us uh, thank Edward for this beautiful talk. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm thanking on behalf of everybody. I guess it's a virtual setup, so everybody cannot, cannot do it uh, uh, so that well, it's visible. And thanks to my hosts in Tehran for the invitation. And so thank, the you so much. thank you. Uh, the host can speak. It was great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And we hope to see Edward, uh, Edward Witten in Iran, hopefully post-pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. We will be very happy to uh, see. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. Take good care, everybody. Thanks, Edward. Okay, great. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.